Well, last Sunday we had the, the gift of Maureen and Donetta sharing our crazy scripture from Ezekiel chapter 1. And chapter 18 is not as crazy as chapter 1, but it's equally an important chapter in the unfolding of the prophet's work uh, that we hear. So we have the first nine verses of Ezekiel in chapter 18. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord, the proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine, and the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. If a man is righteous and does what is lawful and right... If he does not eat upon the mountains or lift up his eyes to the idols of the house of Israel, does not defile his neighbor's wife or approach a woman during her period, does not oppress anyone, but restores to the debtor his pledge, commits no robbery, gives his bread to the hungry and covers the naked with a garment, does not take advance or accrued interest, withholds his hand from iniquity, executes true justice between contending parties follows my statutes and is careful to observe my ordinances, acting faithfully. Such a one is righteous. He shall surely live, says the Lord God. May we share a word of prayer together. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable to you, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. One of the things that Ezekiel found in Babylon with God's people was a word they used a lot was blame for how they got there. They blamed their leader for how they ended up in Babylon. They even blamed previous generations for getting in them in this situation. Blame was being cast out everywhere except on themselves. Someone else had something to do with their plight in life. It reminded me of a story from when I was in high school. My brother was in early middle school. And when my brother had gone into school, my mom went back to work. So both my parents were working. So when we got home from school, we had a few hours before mom or dad got home from the end of their work day. Now, because both of them worked, uh, we had had a person that was a cleaning person that would come and clean the house kind of in the morning hours. And this particular day after school, I had extracurricular activities after school, so my brother got home before I got home. I get home, and my brother's playing video games on the TV in the living room, and I look down just below the TV on the cabinet the TV sat on was this giant gash that was in the cabinet. And it was pretty obvious. There was this giant cut in the wood below the TV. He goes, What happened to that, Stephen? Oh, I think the cleaning person did it. I said, oh, really? Oh, yeah, it was the cleaning person. A few hours later, our parents get home, and they see this huge gash in the cabinet below the TV. And they question me, and they question my brother. They question me. Well, it was there when I got home. So... My brother was playing some video games, so they went and talked to Stephen about the situation and seeing, well, that was here when I got home. I just, was just home playing games. And he blamed it on the cleaning person, this gash in the cabinet. Now, things were not going well at that point between my parents and my brother. There was a lot, and my brother had been cast to his room to think about the day and the circumstances of the day and if he wanted to have a different story than the one he had been telling them. Now, I am kind of a peacekeeper. I don't like angst in the system. And so I made a special trip to my brother's room and said, Stephen, if you just kind of say what you did and fess up, the punishment's going to be way worse than if you hold out with the story you've got. And about 30 minutes later, I saw my brother pass through the den and into my parents' bedroom. And he got punished, but he didn't get punished near what the punishment was supposed to be. It's so easy just to kind of say, well, somebody else did this. Someone else is to blame for my lot in life. 
And one of the things that Ezekiel does in chapter 18, we hear this little proverb. We don't really think much about it at the beginning, but he references this proverb. The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on the edge. Well, it's the parents' fault that the grapes are bad. Well, I don't have anything to do with this. And everyone there in Babylon that was from Israel was saying they were putting blame everywhere else except on themselves. One of the things that Ezekiel was trying to reinforce them is that we can all have circumstances that take place in our life. Sometimes we bring it on ourselves, and sometimes others have bring on angst in a system that may feel unfair or unjust. And we have one response, Ezekiel said, to take responsibility for the life that we're living. Even in the midst of unjust situations, we can choose to respond in those moments, even when the task in front of us may feel difficult or challenging. And so to take on a path of justice, to take on a path of welcoming others, is something we are called to do as a people. It's an interesting thing to, to think about the role that a church plays we can look at society and think, we can blame this and we can blame that. We can look at all the, the things that are going wrong that we'd like to correct in some way. And we're waiting for someone else to do it or someone else to solve it. And Ezekiel was reminding his people is that whatever resolution you want to see happen, you have to be a part of the solution, whatever it might be. Martin Luther King Jr. said that when a church has lost its voice of justice, it has lost its voice to be relevant to the world. The voice we choose to live out matters. Is it a voice of justice? Is it a voice of silence? Is it a voice of inaction? What voice do we enact in our life? Now, the cool thing about Ezekiel was he wasn't just speaking to individuals. He was. He was asking for individuals to take responsibility for their own lives, given the hard circumstance they found themselves in a strange land, wondering if God was there. And he tried to remind them several chapters that God is with you no matter where you are. But you have an opportunity, even in a strange land, to claim what's important to you. And in the midst of learning what you want to claim for yourself, you learn that you are not an individual. You are a part of a larger community. And whatever you claim for yourself, you're also claiming that in the midst of others that are around you. That we are not alone in this fight for responsibility, for action, for justice in the world. We are called to do this work together. I think through all the work this church has done since its inception in 1991 around matters of justice and claiming a voice of responsibility of care and compassion for the world. A church that from its inception was open and welcoming and affirming of the LGBTQ plus community. From its inception a great care for the earth and the planet and taking care of this great gift that God has given to us. We have responded to immigrants and refugees. We have taken on racial justice work in our community. We have taken on food insecurity and homelessness. And the list of justice work continues on in all the facets that we take it on. We are taking responsibility and saying we're not going to wait for someone else to respond in this world. That we are going to say, if it's not going to be someone else, then it should be me that does this work. We can't wait for some past generation. Well, they did enough. I can just rest on my laurels and ride the coattails of those that have gone before me. Came across a quote recently, and I'm just going to say the quote because I can't remember it all. One of the great advocates for racial justice, John Lewis. It's recorded these some of the last words he spoke before he died. In my life, I have done all I can do to demonstrate that the way of peace, the way of love and of nonviolence is the more excellent way. Now it is your turn to let freedom ring. 
So I say to you, walk with the wind, brothers and sisters, and let the spirit of peace and the power of everlasting love be your guide. We could just say John Lewis was a great advocate for racial justice and there should be more people like him in the world. John Lewis was saying the baton in this race of life is being passed over to you. What will be your response in this world? All the hardships, all the aches, all the longings, all the hurts, all the things we experience. If we wait for someone else to respond, more than likely, all those things will just continue. And sometimes we can get to the place where the the burden of it feels so heavy, we almost get to where that burden of heaviness is so heavy, we're like, well, there's nothing I can do that can move the needle, that can make any difference at all. And we then get to a place of blame, and life is unfair, and I never got what I deserved in my life. All we have is our personal agency right now. When I get up in the morning, I have gifts that God has given me. God has given each of you gifts to use in unique ways. And we have to make decisions for ourselves. How will the gifts that God has given me, how will the the gifts that God has given us make a difference in the world? In a political climate that's been as divisive as we've ever seen, we can just think, I don't know how we're going to get through all this stuff. We have to make a decision. We make a decision that our faith will ground us. One of the interesting things about this entire chapter 18, first nine verses, is Ezekiel never talks about belief as the response. If you believe certain things, if you adhere to certain things, the entire list is actions. Things we are called to do. It's one thing to believe something and something else to follow up that belief with activity in our life. One of the things that most of us despise more than anything is someone talking a big talk, and their life doesn't reflect that at all. When I look at the Shalom statement on the back of the bulletin, I don't see those as just words in the bulletin that describe something about our community. That should be a living reality in how we speak, live, walk, and engage the world. A statement's only a statement until we embody it and live it in some way. At some point, we need to make a trek to the parent's bedroom and saying, I might have done this. I might be responsible for this, but this will be my action going forward. This will be my response in a world that seems too hard to overcome. Ezekiel, more than anything else, whether you see it in the the actual verses or not, Ezekiel is offering up to the people in Babylon who feel lost. They feel like the psalmist in Psalm 88 says, God, you remember me no more. The psalmist in Psalm 88 is praying to God almost as if you don't even remember my name. You don't remember that I even exist on this planet. And we can either get to that place or we can do the opposite of that and enact activity and engagement and life and energy and passion. Now, hopefully, you see a little bit of that in me, that I'm not just a person that's As uh, Jenna says, it gives a long talk. I'm just giving you a hard time. (laughs) Gives me a long talk on a Sunday morning. But you see that the talk underneath the talk is living words and living actions every day. Some days I'm going to do that better than other days. But I make a commitment to myself every day that I'm going to do what I can with what I have, with the gifts that have been given to me to share compassion and love in the world. One of my favorite words in all of scripture is the word love. And there's four different definitions of love in scripture. My favorite definition is the one that Paul used in his writings in Corinthians, which is agape love. And that agape love definition is unconditional love. That's my favorite definition of love, unconditional. 
I'll love you if. That's not unconditional love. That's conditional love. We choose to love the world and the people in it with no conditions. And it doesn't mean we get to love the people we like. We're called to love the people that it's difficult to like. We don't get to make choices in that. When we love in that kind of way, we embody the very presence of God living in the world. My hope and prayer is that we not only have the beliefs that are important to us, that ground us, but our very actions give us the agency we need together as a community of faith to be the very people that God already knows that we are.